All right, Mike, I got you cornered, got you on the couch. I get to ask all the questions that us contractors have wanted to ask. Let's do it. Wanted to try and figure out. So maybe we're just, this time, this segment here, speak to some of these issues, some of these things that we just, it's hard to understand. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna kind of give you some scenarios and then you can help, help walk through it. Sure. So here I am. Uh, I have a project. I have to take the material off, um, and I'm trying to market it. And I have a few labs come in, take samples, and they're doing swell, sieve, in our market, in a lot of markets. Two of the predominant things that need to pass is, you know, <laughs> what does my sieve analysis look like? Does it meet this, this, this gradation that I need? And then is swell below a certain amount. In our market, that's usually swell below 1.5. Um, and it's frustrating as a contractor how many times one, two, maybe three labs pass it and one doesn't. And, and the, the test can be quite different. How does it happen? Yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. We, we get involved in that a, a lot too. I'd, I probably, you know, let's talk about that, that swell test and, and why we do it. Yep. Um, one of the things that we're, on, we're really concerned about as geotechnical engineers is the amount of clay that's in soil because clay has the bad stuff in it. It, it, it has the volume change characteristics to it where you might be able to build something today, but lo and behold, a year or two from now, if moisture gets in that material, it, it's going to expand yeah. and some materials can collapse. But with the swell test, what we're trying to identify is Randy said 1.5%. You know, generally we can live with 1.5% swell on soils for a site. So if you have some material that you need to, you know, maybe use on another project, somebody has to test that material for the swell test. Now that's a test that's done in the laboratory. So unfortunately it's not really one that you can see. Like we, if you talk about field density testing, you, you can actually see that test being done on your job site. We'd welcome anybody to come watch a swell test, but there's, it's, it's pretty boring, even more boring than most of the stuff we do. <laughs> uh, because what we do is we actually take a, a sample of soil uh, and we inundate it with, uh, with water to see exactly how much it's, it's going to, to swell. And the challenge with getting two labs to correlate on a, on a swell test is the geotechnical report for the site the soil's coming from might be different than the soil's report that you're trying to get the fill approved for. And everybody has a slightly different approach to what the test parameters are for the swell test. So what do I mean by that? Well, we have to compact the soil to a certain amount in the laboratory because again, that's what's going to happen on the job site. And then that soil has to be at a certain moisture content so that we can do the test in the laboratory. One of the problems is you don't really know what the amount of moisture in that lab prepared specimen is until after the test is over. So if the soils report calls for the swell test needs to be done with so many pounds per square foot of a load at minus 1% of optimum moisture, well in the laboratory, we're just kind of telling by feel, I think I'm at minus 1%, but then you dry it back, hopefully when the test is done to, to say, oh, I really was at minus 1%. Because if you were at minus 3%, that material is gonna swell a lot more because you started with less moisture in it. Right. And so, that's what the test is monitoring. Yeah. So real quick, I'm gonna go back to a few of these things, make sure me as the contractor, I'm following along. Mm -hmm. So you get a specimen, you introduce moisture, ideally to the range that it talks about in the soils report. Yes. Mostly by fill. Um, yeah. And to your credit, to the credit of the, that industry, guys are pretty good at telling like, we're close to optimum moisture. We can get close, yeah. yeah. So then it's prepared, it's compacted, the, the weight, the load's in, introduced, and then you start introducing moisture and mm -hmm. see what happens. Yeah. That's all done. You introduced moisture, it swells, it swells, and then at some point it stops and, it, and you can tell it, we've broken that curve, we, we hit that apex of potential swell. Mm -hmm. Then you take that same specimen, you put it in an oven, 
and you dry it out completely. You should, but that's a shortcut that, because that's time. Yeah. And just like, even if you do that, the, the engineer or the testing company may go, well, it's close enough, we're not gonna rerun it. Yeah. Because you're usually not getting paid to rerun the test. Yeah. If you're the geotech consultant, you had a lump sum fee to do something, why test yeah. it again if you felt but, it was close enough? But in, th in by the test method, it should go back to completely dried out. Or should it go back to I'm, roughly you know, where it was before? Because this one is, is more or less mandated by the soils engineer of record. Yeah. There isn't a tightly specified requirement there. But the only way to really know what your moisture content was At, when you started is to dry it is back. to dry it back all the way to yep. dry it out. And then yeah, compare, because you have the weight that you started yep, with. Compare densities and know okay, this was the difference in moisture. We were mm -hmm. really at minus 1%. Yeah, and it seems ridiculous to some that if you're at minus 1.5% and you were supposed to be at 1%, that that's a big deal. But sometimes that's the difference between getting a passing swell test that you can sell your export material to or not. Yeah. And, you know, as a contractor, you can ask for that data or, or have your own geotech consultant review it to, to make sure it was a good, a good test. But ultimately, that's what happens. I mean, it makes sense to me, especially like, you, you know, the curve, right? So you, you can see the further I was down, yeah. the more likely that delta is. So that it, swell number would grow. That it, makes sense to me. Exactly. And it also makes sense to me as a contractor, you know, it's not uncommon to have your moisture banding be fairly tight you know optimum moisture plus or minus one or two or optimum moisture plus only right yeah hey we know there's some clays in this soil so we say it can be used but it has to be optimum moisture plus up to plus three that's your that's your band so if somebody's doing a swell test at minus two that's not really representative of what could happen because when we place it, it's going to have to be at optimum moisture or grade. Oh yeah. So they're telling you it's going to swell this much, but there's already a spec that says, well, you, you, the, the dirt can't be that dry. Right. Right. So yeah, very insightful. We've had some clients who they are going to build a project for somebody and it's usually on the private money commercial side yep. where they get the soils report <clears throat> provided to them by the owner. And they look at it and they go, you know, we really don't think you need six feet of over X and recompact, or we think the site might, we've worked right next to the site and we think it's good material. You as a contractor, you're not stuck to that soils report, right? I mean, you are, unless you come up with a better option. So we've had some commercial building contractors actually hire us to do a second geotech report with the focus on let's do more borings, let's do more testing. It might be $5,000, but it could save you $100,000, the owner even, to get a more accurate recommendation that somebody can go off of. Yeah. So I just use that as an example of you, just because there's a social report doesn't mean you're stuck with it. Because as we mentioned earlier, some geotech consultants, they just don't do enough borings and testing to come up with the most conservative recommendation or sometimes they do yeah. so we've had that with certain clients where we go basically redo the soil support now you need three to four weeks time to be able to do that but that can save a, a whole lot of money as well yeah. i agree and i think you know that obviously comes back to the discussion we had about partnering and having relationships because maybe just right away saying well we're going to do another soil report isn't the right call but having somebody you can call and say, look, we've worked right by there. Does this seem out of the ordinary? Mm -hmm. and, and that that geotech can be like, oh, yeah, I've, I've done a job within a half a mile. That, that does seem out of the ordinary. Okay, well, what would we need to do to, to get different recommendations? This is what we need. This is how long it would take. Great. Let me go to the owner. Let's see if this is something we can do or not. Um, and so that's where that collaboration, that partnership really pays off. Okay, so so that's the one. That's one of the one of the dying questions for contractors is, yeah. hey, what is this whole swell test? I, I think you shed it a little bit of light on it. We'll, we'll you, you can go and see that. We're actually not going to. Are we going to do that test procedure? Yeah, that's one of them. We're yeah. going to we're going to show. You'll how be able to go and see lab. that test procedure, 
see how it's done and, and get a better idea of what we're talking about. But ultimately it sheds light on how the variability allowed within the test can get those numbers to change. But also as a contractor, understanding that allows you to have those conversations about, well, can you help me understand what was moisture content before we started? Did you dry it out all the way? And, and just start to see, did they make any short, take any shortcuts and, and mm -hmm. how would they affect it? Yeah. So that's good. All right, the other one I think a lot of us contractors are trying to figure out is, um, how is it that there can be the variability that exists within a nuclear density test? Mm -hmm. um, one that I think happens here a lot, uh, I believe it probably happens in other markets. The second test they do may vary, but has to do a lot with a road base. Mm -hmm. or as we call it here, ABC, aggregate base course, um, kind of different names all over the country. But I'm installing a, a base material for a roadway parking lot, go in there with a the nuke density and test doesn't pass. I'm not, I'm not at, I'm not at density, but I happen to have a superintendent who's been doing it a long time or whatever. And he's like, hey, I, I want to get a sand cone test, one of the alternative methods here. Can you do a sand cone? Luckily, the lab we're working with have people who know the test and are familiar with it. They do a sand cone, we pass. How is that possible? Like, what's, yeah. the, what's going on there? Yeah, yeah definitely uh, probably the, the bread and butter test of the, all the testing companies is the field density test. That's yeah. probably half of all the tests that it, any testing company does, it's that test. And I, and I would answer that question by talking about, you know, so often a contractor only goes as far as the percent compaction. Yep. You know, so our spec on a project, we, we needed 95% and these guys are saying we're at 93 and a half. Well, there's a lot of numbers that feed into that arriving at that 93 and a half. And yeah. each one of those variables is uh, fraught with uh, potential testing and subjectivity issues. So I'll kind of, touch on a, on a few of the big ones that, that I find. So basically a percent compaction is simply your in place density divided by a laboratory density of what's hopefully the same material. Yeah. So we, we need to understand what the, the, uh, that, that denominator is first. Where do we come up with that? So we take a sample to the lab and we do what's called a proctor. And the proctor determines the, both the maximum dry density as well as the optimum moisture content of that soil. That way we can determine during construction if adequate moisture is placed in the soil. And of course, if you've got this adequate amount of compaction. Well, one of the challenges is we may have, again, that, that five acre site, we might have one or two proctors. Well, how does our tech know when he goes out there to test today that there maybe is a third material type that I don't even have yet yeah. to know I've got the right denominator to even base my percent compaction on. Yeah. And that's a real problem. Now, most of the time our soils are, they get blended and, and that's not a, not a huge issue. But even the way we determine that maximum dry density in the laboratory, labs can do that differently. And one thing that really skews that maximum dry density is the amount of rock that's present in the soil. So these test methods dictate if you have a certain amount of rock, that changes the way that we do that laboratory proctor. Well, if the laboratory isn't following or paying attention, they may have ran the wrong proctor in the laboratory. So, so real quick, you know, as a contractor, I'm like, okay, so there's a way to determine how much rock there is. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that they're doing a sieve analysis, everything that's number four and above, what, what, where, what's, what's classified as rock? Well, in, in, soil, in the soils world, that's pretty much your number four screen. Okay. If we're talking about asphalt aggregate, it's the number eight okay. size, which is a little bit different. So, so they get a material and let's say it's AB for or road base. Yeah. Everything above the number four should be considered rock. And that, that would, change the way potentially the test is done. They wouldn't run that proctor the same as they would 
a soil profit. That, that, that's correct. It gives you some options there in the laboratory with, with, with how you do that. But what's important to note is when the test is done in the field, um, that field technician has to know the method that was done in the laboratory to determine that maximum dry density because that field technician has to be able to do a rock correction of the in-place rock that he's seeing with his test to correct that laboratory proctor to those exact conditions. And that's where, you know, again, some of the, the testing labs, some of the testing technicians, they'll just use an assumed value of how much rock is there based on what the lab sample had as opposed to actually doing a percent rock at the test location. Gotcha. So that's one one area where we see some errors as to why one company can't correlate with another. Yeah. So I have a guy who's out on the grade, he's doing a nuclear density, he's getting a number that's based off a proctor value from the laboratory. But what you're saying is it's potential that when he goes there, there could be less rock. Mm -hmm. And so really for him to have the right density it's possible like he goes and takes four or five tests and they're all failing but you're like there's no way like right this is this is 9800 mm -hmm. i've been doing this long enough i know that this is this is well over 95. he may need to do a rock correction based so he may need to dig a hole figure out how much rocks there actually weigh it in the fill to say, yep. oh, this aggregate source has changed a little bit, rock is heavier or lighter. Oh yeah, and you need that specific percent rock to be able to do the calculations for the numerator in that percent compaction, which is your in-place density. Yeah. And then before we even get into that, all rock was not created equal either. Yeah. Um, we're pretty fortunate here in the Phoenix area. We've got some pretty dense, hard aggregate. It's great for concrete and asphalt. Yeah. It has a specific gravity of 2.6, but you can be working in other parts of the state. It might be as low as 2.2, 2.4. And just, again, that sounds pretty small, but when you work through the math, that could be the difference between a failing test and a, and a passing test. If you don't know the, the true specific gravity of the soils that you're working on. And then it also leads to, does, do we just need a different proctor today because we've gotten into a different part of the site and this just looks different. Yeah. We're getting failing results now or we're getting 104% compaction with this proctor so something has changed yeah. here. Yeah. So there are ways we can do a faster proctor, we call it a one point proctor, where we can sample those materials out at the site and, and determine its maximum dry density and optimum moisture, we can then take that back to the lab, but it would take a day to get the full proctor done on it to ver confirm that one point proctor. But and, and often the test can be run perfectly, it's just that they don't have the right numbers to start the calculations with to get a correct percent compaction. Yeah, if you've been on a job site with, a, I would say a good superintendent who's got earth moving experience, all of a sudden compaction becomes an issue and it hasn't been for days. I mean, I always hear them say, well, can we do a one point? Now I've found though that not all geotechnical technicians all you know, know how to do that. Right. Um, not that we're going to become experts in it, but you know, wh where does it, why do they call it a one point and mm -hmm. how just briefly, what does it look like? Oh yeah. Like? Yeah. And I'll explain why there's some, I mean, I would say, the majority of testing technicians just don't have the skill set to be able to do a one point proctor compared to a lab proctor. So with a lab proctor, the material is dried all the way back yep. or almost all the way back. And then we add specific moisture contents to different samples of that same material. So we may do one at 4%, 6%, 8% and 10%. And we compact those specimens in the laboratory to produce that optimum moisture content. That's the proctor yep. curve. Yep. Well, when you do a one point proctor in the field, that's only a meaningful test if you compact that soil pretty close to optimum moisture content. And that's where having a good technician is important because he has to be able to basically fill yeah. and say, oh, this, this is really close to optimum. Oh yeah, because 
they might need to, in the, in the sample they're running the test on, they may need to just add some moisture to it to bring it up to optimum moisture content and then compact that specimen to get a hopefully an accurate one point proctor. And it's also the kind of thing where just like anything in life, if you have a technician that it's been nine months since their last one point proctor, well, even though it's a pretty simple test, you may not have the right tool to do the job. You, your stuff might not be calibrated. So we always try to get our guys to, to do that test once a week. And then we also keep samples in the lab of different maximum dry density samples that they don't know the answer to the test on and we have them go and do a one point so that we can be assured that because not not all of our guys i'm comfortable with doing a one point especially our newer folks they yeah. need to prove they can do that before because i have to sometimes put my professional engineering license on one point proctors and the associated field density test and I, there's some i'm just not comfortable doing that yet with so I think pretty commonly the nuclear density in most markets is probably the most common. Called the density. gold standard. Yeah. It's easier to do, yeah. it takes less time. But in, in most markets, there's an alternative. In ours, it happens to be the sand cone test uh, that is very common. We have some agencies that's like their go-to. So, you know, it can be frustrating when you are out there doing densities and you're not getting densities with the new gauge. The sand cone comes in and, and it fixes it. Mm -hmm. But maybe more frustrating is all my, all my QC tests were good with the new gauge. Now QA comes in and they are gonna use the sand cone method and all of a sudden they're not. And, and mm -hmm. what you're saying is that could simply be a product of the rock correction. And that may not be the only reason, but sim that could simply be a, hey, the rock correction's not right yeah. on an aggregate base material. Yeah, because of one, one of the main differences between the sand cone density test and the nuclear density test, when you do a sand cone density test, you physically have to excavate into yeah. the soil and come up with the percent rock. Like you, you have to do that. Whereas with a nuclear density test, even though you're supposed to do that, a, a lot of times I see yeah. testers just use an assumed amount of, of rock. Yeah, they, they've, they've had some tests from that pit that they think mm -hmm. this is what it's been and it's six months old, but that's what they're using. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of other uh, parameters that go into a sand cone density test that can skew that result as well. One of them is uh, what we're doing with a sand cone is it's basically a volume replacement method yep. where we excavate a, a fairly small amount of soil. Uh, I believe it's a four and a half inch diameter. It might be six inches deep. So it's about this big. We pull all the material out of there. We weigh it. We get the moisture content, the amount of rock that's in there. But then what we do is we set uh, a jar of sand that fills that hole up, well, we know the density of that sand, and then we can calculate what the density of the corresponding stuff, whatever it was that we pulled out of there. But that sand that we use, that all sand was not created equal either. So you, you, you said you know it's density, but you need to make sure you really know it's density. I, exactly. Because it and could change. You, for, for us, for instance, when we get a pallet of sand, it usually comes in these 50, 40 to 50 pound bags, we empty those out in a garbage pail and somebody calibrates the sand to get its actual pounds per cubic foot. Because again, if that number is off by just a couple of pounds, when you work it through the calculations, you could be getting a false positive or false negative, or just a value that doesn't marry up to what you were getting using that nuclear density gauge. Yeah. So, there's just so many variables that go into that. It sounds so simple, percent compaction. It's my in-place density divided by my lab density. But there can be just so many mistakes made there. Even if the, the testing company is setting out to do everything by the book, yeah. sometimes there's things that happen that's completely out of, out of their control. Yeah, I'm a contractor, I'm on the site. Uh, I asked the, the labs, hey, do you have proctors here? Yeah, we have two proctors. Um, I feel like it would be okay as a contractor to say, 
can you help me just, what are those two proctors? Like, help me see so that I can help my guys understand if we see a material change, what it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's not uncommon in this market to get down five, six feet. And because, you know, we're in a floodplain <clears throat> to run yeah. into some alluvium material that might be a lot sandier. Um, or all of a sudden we might pick up a lot of silts. And now we have a third, maybe a fourth proctor. Um, some of the dam projects we've done are miles long. Oh yeah. And it's like hundreds of proctors. Yeah. Now those proctors all start to kind of blend into a range, mm -hmm. but knowing proctors as a, understanding what soil they, they have for their proctors as a contractor would be important, I think. Oh yeah. And it, it's not offensive in any way for me to say like, hey, I see we have two proctors, could you help me understand what those materials are absolutely and uh you know a couple points there i mean one of them is on on some earthwork projects it's written into the specifications that at the start of every day the testing company must do a one point proctor to confirm yeah. that there's a lab proctor to back up where we're where we're at right. okay now that's pretty extreme and we find that on on earthen dam projects where the the soil is the, the structure, yeah. basically. So that's one thing that uh, that we need to be cognizant of. It, it's also important to note, like a lot of times, how do we arrive at what the, the proctor value, this uh, maximum dry density is? Well, usually we get a call that a project's about to start. And so we send somebody out there and they'll sample the materials on that site there's a good chance there hasn't actually been any earthwork yet. Yeah, so it's it's mostly surface samples. It's mostly surface, but we might be able to have the contractor, they'll have a backhoe or something we can get down below. But it, we kind of use that as a starting point. At least we have some density from the, from the site. But as I mentioned, a lot of times those soils all get blended together anyway. So you often need to evaluate or get a new maximum dry density of the blended materials to, to truly know where we're at with with this site and obviously the bigger the site is the more linear it is or the deeper it goes the 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 range of maximum dry densities you're going to have yeah. a lot of projects we do randy we might just have one or two laboratory proctors that that's all we need yeah but we've had some where we've had as many as 80 or more laboratory proctors and you might go as a contractor isn't all the soil the same? Well, when you do about 80 of them, you've almost identified every range of maximum dry density and optimum moisture on that, that given site. But yeah. if you've got a, a five mile long structure with a bunch of fills coming from all over the place, you, you may need that yeah. level of testing. Yeah, and it's important because you think your range is, you know, maybe that banding really isn't that big. It's, it's 10 pounds mm -hmm. overall, maybe not even that much. But when you have a 98% compaction spec, yes, that that very you know if you're on either end of those, the amount of compactive effort it would take you to try and get to 98 is infinite because you couldn't get there, right? If yeah, if, if yeah. they were using the wrong proctor, you could beat the ground to death, and yeah. it's never going to get there. Yeah, and 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 that was another uh, potential testing issue that uh, it it does come up, but sometimes we do what's called a standard proctor yeah. and other times specifications call for what's called a modified proctor and i think it's important for a contractor to to know the difference a lot of times we see modified proctors in airport construction specifically under runways well why is that well it's because runways have some of the highest loading on them of any structures out there yeah. and what a modified proctor does is uh, we, in the laboratory, it's the same material we run the test on, but we have a heavier hammer to pound that material with, uh, and we use more blows to do the pounding. So you might have 110 pounds per square foot with a standard proctor, but with a modified proctor, it could be 115, 118 pounds or more. Yeah, that's actually interesting. I've, I've always heard them. I've never, I've actually never heard that there was a difference in the weight. So that means I might have a soil that with a, as a contractor, I always know standard proctor, easier to get compaction. 
modified proctor harder, but really it's because you've changed the denominator. Exactly, the that's soil, exactly you, you right. You said the soil's 100% compaction was 110 pounds per cubic foot, but under the modified, you actually got to 113. Mm -hmm. So this 100% wasn't really 100%. Yeah. And so now all of a sudden you have to get three pounds per cubic foot more in your right. compaction. Right, and it also changes what the optimum moisture content is too. It actually reduces the yeah, optimum. Because, because, you hit, you're hitting because you're hitting it that much harder. Yeah. So as a contractor, you know, again, sometimes you see conflicts in like the Souls Report references a standard proctor, but yet the specs call for a modified proctor. Yeah. Well, th there's kind of a red flag there. That's like what, point. what, we're, we're going to be starting this project in a few weeks. Can somebody tell me what, what are the rules of engagement on the project are? Am I going to be doing a modified? Because you need to know that yeah. the earthwork contractor needs to know on day one, what's the criteria for doing, yeah. for moving on to the next lift of material. Yeah. I mean, I, like, I'm thinking, hey, I'm a contractor. I'm listening to this right now. I'm thinking, hey, I'm a field engineer. I'm a project engineer. I'm a superintendent. I'm searching specs. I'm searching souls report for modified and standard proctor seeing is there discrepancy mm -hmm. and if so i'm getting an rfi in right now oh yeah and what happens a lot that i see uh sometimes an owner will hire a geotech company that's not even in phoenix to do the soils report yeah. because they've got relationship in right. dallas and we just use them wherever yeah. well in dallas it might be completely modif modified proctors everywhere so they come here and do a soils report and everything's in a modified proctor well, you better make sure everybody on the team is aware it's a modified proctor job because everybody's rolling out there assuming it's just like every other Phoenix project with a standard proctor. Yeah. So those are little things that you can uh, be proactive about during the pre-construction between the bid and the job getting started so that you're not stuck on day one and you don't even have... Because <clears throat> again, some of these tests can take days in the laboratory to run. Meanwhile, what are you, you know, your, your crew is may not be working. All right, this has been awesome. I, I got one more question. And this one is in regards to compaction as well. So I'm out there, whether it's asphalt, whether it's filter sand, don't see it quite as much on dirt, but it's usually when there's more aggregates in your soils. How come I can see my densities increase and at some point they start coming down? What's happening? What's happening there? And as a contractor, what should I be aware of? Because I know oftentimes it can be really frustrating. Like, what, 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 like, what do I do? I, all of a sudden my compact, my compaction is coming down. And, and I, you, you'll hear terms like, oh, we, we broke. Mm -hmm. What does that really mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty common uh, with, with asphalt, but we can have that with soils too. Uh, but, but basically with any material, where you've got both a, a liquid component to it and a soil and aggregate component. When you get too much liquid in there, it starts to displace the soil and rock particles. So what we're trying to do is get as close to that optimum moisture content with soils at the time of compaction, because if we get over that, <clears throat> I mean, that might be great. Hey, we're actually exceeding what the requirement is but you're gonna make it harder to achieve compaction on those soils because as you're trying to push down or compact this soil, there, there's so much water in it that it's pushing apart your soil's particles, which is what we're measuring for compaction. Yeah. So as we work through that compaction process, that, that's usually the, the yeah. variable that we see there. And so like in asphalt, there's also air voids. So yeah. at some point you start taking all those air voids out Mm -hmm. Now it's liquid, and now that's why you, all of a sudden you start to get more movement mm -hmm. because you've really compacted it more than you should? Yep, and because asphalt is designed to have a certain amount, a very controlled amount of air voids in it. Yep. Like we, we, we sometimes think, well, that's got to be bad to have air in asphalt. It yeah. should be totally solid, right? Yeah. No, no, no. We want a little bit of air voids in there so that the pavement can be, it's called a flexible pavement for yeah. a reason. It needs to move right. just a little bit around. Um, and that amount of air voids is, is pretty small, five, eight percent or yeah. so, depending on the, you know, the, the requirements. So if we over compact it and we start to fill those, those voids in, then we can start to see the, the density decrease on the site. One of the other things though I've seen is if you have a, you know, a, we have lots of mixed designs here, different 
municipalities, agencies, um, you know, they're, they're the term of like a super pave mm -hmm. has more aggregate, less oil content generally, and yeah. usually maybe a little bit bigger aggregate too. Um, that depends on the market you're in. But how come if I have say like a three quarter inch or a, a, a 19 millimeter mix, a little bit larger aggregate and uh, a little bit lower oil content, how come when I'm placing smaller lifts, why is it sometimes like it's really hard to get compaction? Yeah, the uh, you know there's a there's requirements for once you get to a certain amount of the thickness of a lift, yeah. the nominal aggregate size, which is kind of the controlling aggregate size of the mix, needs to account for that. Yeah, because you know we soils you might be able to get compaction on a six or even an eight inch lift or more, yeah. but with asphalt you know it's often just you, you don't need that much so you're trying to get compaction on just a couple two three inches of material yeah. so you don't want a bunch of large aggregate particles in there yeah. because all the energy of the compaction process is going into those large particles so they're not moving around and attaining that higher level of in place yeah. density yeah, so sometimes it can just be a, a poor design of a, and a, a wrong uh, mix design being recommended for the actual application. Yeah, and then I've heard because if you get, you know, one of our specs here that's very common is three, uh, you know, one and a half times nominal aggregate size. So if you mm -hmm. have a three quarter inch mix, they want your minimum thickness to be one and a half times that three quarter inch. Mm -hmm. um, what happens though is what I've, what I've been told, and you can maybe validate this is like in those mixes, if you're say placing a, an inch and a half lift and you have three quarter inch rock, with the vibratory, those rocks can actually be bouncing off each other. Mm -hmm. And so you, you just can't get the compaction because there's not enough there to move around. Those right. rocks are just bouncing off each other. Yeah, and that's one of the main things when we move from the pre-super pave world into super pave is the mixtures became, they, they generally have less oil content in them. Yeah and the they're they're just bonier they have more rock in them yeah. and the rock itself has to be crushed in in such a way that it's going to be more stable once it once you achieve compaction yeah but it's just harder to yeah, get yeah. to that compaction level because again the more oil you have the more you're going to be able to get those particles to move around as you're you're compacting it and that is that and that's sometimes we've seen where you may have to do a few passes with compaction and then go to a static roller to really, like if mm -hmm. you keep pounding it, once those rocks get close enough, they just start bouncing off each other mm -hmm. where you might have to run a vibratory roller and then switch to static or then go to a, you know, nine wheel, 11 wheel pneumatic roller. Pneumatic yeah. roller. yeah, and that's the thing with uh, getting a rolling pattern established. Yeah. I mean, you, you might have to put a lot of different equipment out there to figure out what's the best way we're gonna be able to uh, work with this specific mix especially you know we, we were talking about airports i mean getting a runway asphalt project off the ground can be very difficult because you have to show you can achieve those those air void levels and compaction before you can go into what they call full production on a runway asphalt project and i've been involved in some where we might have to do five ten fifteen control strips or more before they've got the right equipment to deal with that specific mix that they're trying to get compaction on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that can be very, that can be very challenging. Yeah. Well, I would just like to say thank you on behalf of all contractors for answering some of our questions. I hope to have you back again and, and, and maybe we can get some more questions from you, the audience on things that you're trying to understand you've always had for the geotechnical guy. Um, and so uh, just thanks and uh, I hope you guys enjoy this. Yeah, definitely.